Okay, I guess we can get started. All right, welcome to lecture two of Dark Matter. Can people up at the back hear me okay? Okay, very good. So today, first I want to talk about the last thing that we actually know about dark matter, which is that it's pretty cold. So I want to just outline for you how structure formation works in cold dark matter models, how it works in hot dark matter models, and that w how that tells us that dark matter is mostly cold. And I want to say a little bit about what constraints we can set on warm dark matter. That will be a pretty natural segue into th then the question of, all right, we have this information. There appears to be this stuff out there. It's 80% of the matter in the universe. We know we have quite a bit of information about its properties that tell us that it doesn't really accord with any particle in the standard model. So if we begin to ask the theory question, of, OK, what is this then? One way that I find useful to classify this is to talk about what are the possible mass scales for the dark matter, what constraints can we set on each of those mass scales, and in each of these regimes, what are the possibilities for how the dark matter got its observed abundance? Why is it 80% of the total? So then I want to talk about the classic example origin scenario for dark matter, which is the dark matter was in thermal equilibrium with the standard model and then froze out. And we'll see that that forces you to think about a fairly specific mass range for the dark matter. It's not one mass point, it's a wide mass range, but it gives you a, re a region to aim at. Um, if this goes super quick for some reason, then I will also talk about the second classic scenario, which is axion dark matter, which corresponds to a very different mass range and a very different history, a very different cosmological history. Um, if not, then that will be the first thing that we talk about tomorrow. Okay, so let me first just continue with what we talked about yesterday, talking about gravitational probes of dark matter. I said, so how, so we, we talked a little bit yesterday, and I think you'll hear more about it in Tony's lectures, about we, the perturbations in the cosmic microwave background, and you'll learn in Tony's lectures about how these cosmological perturbations arise from inflation and how they evolve. So those tiny density perturbations in the early universe that we can see observationally through anisotropies in the CMB temperature later form the seeds of galaxies and galaxy clusters. So the sort of standard picture which seems to describe what we see pretty well is that after last scattering, the photons are no longer scattering efficiently on the visible matter. As we said, it's the surface of last scattering, so the photons free stream. So at that point, you no longer have the, the ordinary matter is now all neutral. No, you, long, you no longer have a lot of oscillation pressure preventing these perturbations from collapsing. And so then the overdensities grow under gravity. And eventually they start collapsing into gravitationally bound structures. Now, there are two broad pictures for how, now, so there are two sort of broad pictures for how this could happen. The first, the cold dark matter scenario, which is what we believe is actually what happened, is that the smallest, um, the smallest, densest halos form first, they form earliest in the universe, and then as time goes on, these small overdensities, these small clumps of dark matter, accrete together and merge and form larger structures. So. That's the case where the dark matter has almost no velocity of its own. So cold dark matter, small structures, This is the time sequence. Small structures form first. They later produce large structures. This means that in these big dark matter halos around galaxies and galaxy clusters that we've been talking about, you expect there to be many small subclumps of dark matter left over from that early universe, left over from this early snowballing process. So, but let's ask hypothetically, what would have happened if dark matter was relativistic during this process? So it was moving very rapidly early on. Well, in that case, 
these small structures would simply not form because the dark matter would have enough ketonic energy to basically move out of these gravitational potential wells. Okay? I mean, if I want to trap something in a potential, it can't be too going too fast. It can't be going faster than the escape velocity. Right? So if the dark matter is moving very quickly, we say that it has some free streaming length and it will erase all the density perturbations with scales smaller than that free streaming length. So if this happens, if hot dark matter erases small scale structures, what happens is that we don't get any structures forming at all until later in time when the dark matter has slowed down enough due to the expansion of the universe. Th so what happens in hot dark matter is that the largest structures form first. They can be gravitationally bound, so you know, it, your free streaming length has a certain finite scale. Things bigger than that can form. So large structures are, are first and then they fragment to form small structures. So in the hot dark matter picture of the universe, the very first kinds of structures that would form would be the halos that we call galaxy clusters today. The subsequent halos, the halos that support galaxies and so on, would have to form once those large halos became unstable and started to break apart. Now, that is, this 100% of dark matter being hot dark matter is actually inconsistent with, I mean, we have measurements of very early galaxies in the universe. Um, it's not consistent with this picture. We have to have the galaxies before the galaxy clusters. So that leads us to think that we, um, so that tells us that we're closer to this scenario than to this scenario. So the current constraints are that um, the hot dark matter should be order 1% or less of total dm. We can certainly have some hot dark matter. Neutrinos are hot dark matter, for an example. Neutrinos are not very good at forming bound structures because they're so light and they're relativistic. They're, well, we don't know exactly what their exact mass is, but they're certainly relativistic during the CMB epoch. So like for an example of a study, This author has a paper in 2013 where they looked at constraints like for extra neutrino species or for axion-like species, and basically that set constraints that the, these highly relativistic species had to, be ma had to have masses less than about an EV, which corresponded to about 1% or less of the total dark matter, which is fine for neutrinos. We know for other reasons their mass scales have to be less than about an EV. Um, okay, now, so then there's an intermediate, so okay, so, Less than 1% of the dark matter, probably most of the dark matter, but you can ask, well, what if we had something intermediate between these two regimes? What if dark matter was not really relativistic, but it wasn't going quite so fast that you could just assume that its velocities were zero? So this is the warm dark matter scenario. So what this means is that the dark matter had a non-negligible free streaming length early in the universe, so it could travel a large enough distance to wipe out some scales that might be potentially observable today. So whether dark matter is cold or warm is sort of a question about, well, what are the smallest structures that you can observe? <laughs> if it's something that could potentially have observable consequences, we, we, we talk about it as being, as being warm dark matter. So the warm dark matter case is just the same physics, as hot dark matter, and so it w there's a non-negligible free streaming length that wipes out small structures. So the observational signature of warm dark matter is that there's less small scale structure than you would have expected to see under a cold dark matter model. 
Now, if you remember yesterday's lecture, you might think, well, actually, that, that sounds quite good, because we said that there were some observational hints that um, small-scale halos were less concentrated, there was less in the way of cusps and stuff than we expected from CDM. So maybe you could use warm dark matter to like, smooth out cusps at small scales to prevent really small-scale halos from forming. Maybe the reason why the Milky Way doesn't have a lot of satellites uh, does it maybe the too big to fail problem, which is the Milky Way doesn't seem to have as many big satellites as you would expect? Well, may maybe that could have something to do with early free streaming wiping out structures or reducing the number of structures on these scales. So, what can we actually say about that? Sorry, well, the zero thought of thing is while this is a good idea, um, it seems that. The constraints on warm dark matter from other channels, in particular from what's called the Lyman Alpha Forest, are generally strong enough that it's hard to solve all the small scale structure problems just with warm dark, just by making dark matter warm. Um, so let's see how that works. So if we want to make this precise, we can talk about the matter power spectrum. This is a big topic. I'm just going to outline some basics here. So what I want to describe is how much power I have in small scale structures versus intermediate scale structures versus large scale structures. Okay? So let me define the fractional overdensity at a position in space. So it's just going to be the dark matter density minus the average density normalized to the average density. So this is like just the a measure of the fractional density fluctuations. This is telling me um yeah, how, how, bi how big are my deviations from density? Now I can take a Fourier transform of this. So this is just the momentum space version of this quantity. So this is telling us about like how much, how, how big are my fluctuations on different angular scales, different momentum scales. And then I can define a power spectrum quantity, which is just the expectation value of this Fourier space fluctuation squared. So then this is a measure of basically how much power I have on different, um, on different momentum scales, on different inverse length scales. Now we can, so this is convenient because it just boils things down to one simple function. And you can measure this simple function by looking at observations of halos at many different scales. So, so I can make a plot of this. I'll measure k, so this is an inverse length scale, so I'll measure it in inverse megaparsecs. So this has, this has this characteristic shape, which you can predict from working out the evolution of the cosmological perturbations. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I'm just going to tell you if the cold dark matter shape looks something like this. So then the effects of warm dark matter would be essentially to suppress the power once I go to small length scales. So that's large K scales. So warm dark matter does something like this. Hot dark matter might do something like this. When we measure, so, okay, so how can we measure this? Yeah? Sorry? As, uh, um, okay, over the, um, good. So um, this will be an, th this will, okay, so, Right, so you're looking at, so you've got this measurement over the, I mean, it's, it's an average over, so I, I, I mean, this is, I, well, okay, I guess this is an average partly just over, over direction, right? I mean, this is, a, this is a magnitude of K. So yeah, so this is just averaging over possible directions on the sky. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, okay. So if we want to so if we want to measure this well first at very large scales 
we have measurements of the cosmic microwave background. These told us about what these perturbations were like really early in the universe. So those perturbations that we see in the CMB now, the universe has expanded by a factor of a thousand since then. So the anisotropies in the CMB correspond to pretty large angular scales in terms of this K. So let me, okay, so this is like 0.1. This will be one. I'll have like 10 out here. 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So the CMB sort of measures scales from about here on downwards. So then we have observ but we're not limited to just the CMB. We can observe galaxies, and then we so, so you have to do a little bit of work here because you're trying to measure the um, power spectrum of all matter, and what we can see is just the visible matter. But to a reasonable approximation, the visible matter can act as a tracer of the dark matter if you're just looking at galaxy scales. You, you, you do have to do a conversion factor between how much matter versus dark matter, how much visible matter versus dark matter you think you have in different galaxies. But modulo that, so then galaxy observations sort of from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey give us a handle on the spectrum at these. So I, I should say this is like a co-moving length scale. So th this is telling us like the inverse length scale of how big the mode was in the early universe. It's not telling us about the physical size of the galaxies and so on today, because they're taking the dark matter over a much larger region that has then collapsed down to form the galaxy. So when I say, so you because, so I'm saying like this is um, 0.1 inverse megaparsecs, so one over 10 megaparsecs. Clearly, if you're looking at galaxies, galaxies are not 10 megaparsecs across, but the dark matter in a galaxy may have collapsed from a mode that had an original wavelength of 10 mega, that had a wavelength of 10 megaparsecs. I mean, so if you want to convert this into a mass scale instead of a K scale, then the conversion is basically just mass equals rho times V, which is like rho over K cubed. So. So the total mass in one of these modes just looks like this. Okay, so, so you can convert this to an estimate and see that indeed this corresponds like galaxy scale masses. Now, at this high end, we have measurements out to about, we have measurements from what's called the Lyman Alpha Forest. So the Lyman Alpha Forest is basically a measurement of how much small scale structure there was at about redshifts from two to six. So when the universe was about, it was a factor of a few smaller than it was now. So we, there were very early, there are some very early quasars in the universe, sources of intense radiation from before redshift six. And that radiation travels to us through the, all the intervening redshifts. And in the epoch from about red, and that, and it gives us a probe just by, it's called the Lyman Alpha Forest because we look at the Lyman Alpha line of hydrogen. Um, so we look at absorption and emission in that line. And that gives us a map of how much gas there was and how the gas was distributed in intermediate redshifts. So the resulting absorption map gives us a measure of how of what kind of mass scales the gas clouds were at. What was the distribution of the matter power spectrum of these gas clouds? So that allows us to get a handle on what this matter power spectrum was doing out to about 1 to 10 inverse megaparsecs, which is the strongest constraint at present on warm dark matter. So what does that actually tell us about warm dark matter? Well, if you, so now, so now we're going to do something a little less general than what we've done before, because now we're not just going to talk about the gravitational effects of dark matter, but what temperature it had. So if you had dark matter that 
was in thermal contact with the standard model at early times, and it eventually decoupled from thermal contact with the standard model, but it did so while it was still relativistic, then you can show that it's free streaming, that the free streaming length that it gives at late times is related to its mass, and that the size of this cutoff is something of order, and then there's a there's a factor which depends on like how the just when did it de how much g star how much the degrees of freedom change since it decoupled so what is the temperature of this stuff compared to the temperature of neutrinos so point I want to make here this kind of scale five inverse megaparsecs this is about what you would expect for KeV scale dark matter that be, had been in thermal contact with the standard model early on. You can do something a little bit, so this is a cutoff scale. Um, you can do numerical simulations to make this a little bit more precise. This is just from a, a really simple estimate. So, um, and there's a paper by this. which lays out these estimates. So more precisely, the cutoff scale at which the matter power spectrum has dropped by a half in this scenario looks something like this, where these are just the cosmological parameters describing the amount of dark matter and the um, expansion of the universe. But you don't need to know the details of this. All you need to take away from this is the Lyman Alpha Forest gives us constraints on dark matter around the 1 keV mass range if it was in thermal contact with the standard model. And under, and in particular, to, to be a little bit more specific in this, paper by the same authors from last year. This is, as far as I know, the best current constraints. Uh, 0.1764, yeah. They find a limit from the Lyman Alpha Forest that m chi has to be greater than about 5 kV um, under this set of assumptions. Um, so I, I think they're basically assuming here that this factor is one, but I'd need to go back. I'd need to go back and double check. So, okay. So this tells us. So structure formation is a pretty powerful tool for constraining dark matter. It tells us to a first approximation dark matter is cold. There's a lot of small scale stop structure around that you wouldn't expect with hot dark matter. Um, if your dark matter is too light and too warm then it can potentially erase structure on levels that we can experimentally probe by looking at this um, absorption in hydrogen clouds at intermediate redshifts. And at the moment, the current constraints are, if your dark matter was in thermal contact with the standard model, then its mass scale should be higher than a few keV. Any questions about this? Again, um, I've, I mean, this is, of course, just been an outline. If you want more detail on these constraints, this is, as far as I know, the most up-to-date constraints. And this paper has just some information on how these limits are done. OK, so I should also say that this scale corresponds to suppressing um, mass scales for the dark matter halos around like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses. So this is smaller than the smallest measured dwarf galaxies that we've seen in the Milky Way. But it's not massively smaller. So that's a potential other group of warm dark matter. If you could measure significantly smaller dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way or in the field, the problem is they don't tend to have many stars. But if you could measure their presence, that would potentially be another handle on uh, the presence or absence of warm dark matter. OK. So that provides a nice entry point for me to then say, OK, let's just ask the general question. What possible masses could dark matter have? What is our scale here? OK, so let's first think about the very low end of the scale. If I want to make dark matter as light as possible, 
what are some limits that I could potentially run into? Well, the limit at this end of the spectrum corresponds to dark matter so light that its de Broglie wavelength is bigger than a dwarf galaxy. So this is another way to suppress structure. If the, if, you know, your free streaming length is fine, but if the dark matter is so light that a galaxy cannot fit within one wavelength, it's not going to work. <laughs> okay? We measure bound dark matter structures. So M, dm has to be larger than, so, well, it's wa so its wavelength is like, um, h bar is like what, 1 over M. So this has to be like larger than 1 over size of the galaxy. And you might think, and, and these Lyman alpha constraints that I've told you about, again, because they probe the smallest scale dark matter structures, they set a limit on the possible mass of warm dark matter, which is somewhere around 10 to the minus 21 EV. So this extreme mass range is sometimes called fuzzy dark matter. Because the idea is that on galaxy scales, your um, the, the yeah the dark matter just can't have structure smaller than this. It's effectively blurred out on galaxy scales. So let's take that. So I don't know any way or I don't really know any way around this because this is just a measure of de Broglie wavelength. Okay, so we've got a hard lower limit on what our dark matter mass could possibly be. Now, at the other end of this scale, you have, well, what if dark matter is not a particle? What if it's something macroscopic, like a, like a black hole, something along these lines? So we know that if dark matter We know that dark matter had to be around when the universe was only a few hundred thousand years old. So if it's something like this, it has to have been formed very early in the universe. So the candidate people mostly talk about is microscopic black holes left over from inflation. There's a question up the back. Uh, but because we can see density, like sharp density perturbations on scales much smaller than that, and you can't have sharp density variations if it's within a wavelength of the dark matter. I mean, yeah, we, we, like we measure, what we can measure the density profile of dwarf galaxies from looking at the stars orbiting around those dwarf galaxies, and you know, the, the debate is over whether is there a core or not at the very center, but there's very clearly a large upturn. So, uh, yeah, that, the wavelength has got to be smaller than that. Okay, so if we're looking, so in this case, the scenario that people talk about is maybe you could have primordial black holes formed in the very early universe, and that these, moving forward to the present day, could become the dark matter. Now, um, this scenario has a lot of challenges. The, there, are, there are constraints from looking at gravitational lensing of these objects. If one of, if a black hole were to pass between um, us on Earth and a background star, we would expect to get the, st the star to be magnified by the transit of that object. I believe you may have talked about this a little bit in the discussion sessions yesterday, and there will be either posted or soon to be posted an example problem about working out these rates. So what you find, so the question of where the primordial black holes could be 100% of the dark matter is a current controversy. So as far as I know, the current limits basically say that, well, if you believe every constraint that's in the literature, your answer is no to this question. Um, there's a, so if you look, so there are, so this is constrained by searches for lensing events. So here the picture is, so you've got Earth, you've got, a back, you've got a star in the background, and you've got a black hole or other similar object such that the light from star, the star gets bent around it. So if our halo is completely full of primordial objects that are lighter than about five solar masses, then we should have seen these transit events already. The number density of these things 
would have been large enough. So this, so searches of this type are one thing that you can do. There are other constraints that come from, um, so these are most solid constraints. These are really quite hard to get around. There are other bounds from the CMB, from saying if these black holes were around, then matter could accrete onto them during the CMB epoch. And that way they would not be like other kinds of dark matter. There are bounds from if one of these were to pass through weakly gravitationally bound structures in the Milky Way halo, it would tend to disrupt those structures. Like if I've got two stars that are just weakly bound to each other and then a black hole barrels, barrels through the middle of the system, it will often unbind them from each other. So the fact that we see systems like that sets some constraint on machos. So, um, so patiently. So if you, if you only believe this first type of constraint, then it says that you can almost rule out the whole mass range, but there are possible, so it rules out most masses, but there is a window open in the range of black holes with masses between about a 10 to 100 solar masses and other smaller windows at, five, at very small masses, so like 5 times 10 to the si minus 16 solar masses and 2 times 10 to the minus 14 solar masses. And these are extremely narrow windows. So that's just from the Lynch and Singh searches alone. If you take seriously these other bounds, then they rule out these remaining allowed windows. So the statement that there's a window open here is a debated one at the moment. Um, it relies largely on these bounds being a bit weaker than people, th than their proponents think they are. Now, this window from 10 to 100 solar masses is, particul is being particularly heavily debated at the moment because that's the range that in which LIGO just saw a bunch of black hole mergers. So um, th there is one would be really cool if it was true possibility that LIGO is a dark matter discovery <laughs> experiment. Um, but as I said, uh, in order for that to be true, you do have to, you, you do have to think that there are problems with a number of these other constraints that have been proposed. So I'm just going to point you to a reference. So. So this has a pretty good summary of the current constraints. Yeah? Yeah, so good. So this paper talks a little bit. So most of the constraints are set by assuming a delta function in the mass, which is obviously not completely realistic. So particularly with these windows down here, the window is really super tight. So if you make the mass spectrum broader, it will probably just be ruled out. Um, so. The general picture, I think, for this 10 to 100 solar mass window is that in order to not be ruled out, you, you need a pretty tight mass spectrum. So explaining how that would come about is also highly non-trivial. But yeah, so I think this paper, and there are some other papers, have considered what happens if you allow a broader mass spectrum. Generally, it becomes more constrained rather than less. Yeah? That is the, uh, what well, is a collection of many primordial black holes. That is the hypothesis that they are trying to rule out. Um, yeah, so it, um, so it varies depending on what mass you're looking at. Um, I mean, there are certainly, so there's a nice figure in this paper, which I don't think I can reproduce on the fly, which shows it in terms of the maximum amount of dark matter that you can have allowed. But so there are places where I think you could probably have 10 or 20% and that would be fine. There are other regions, like in regions where these lensing constraints are really strong, they can rule out like 10 to the minus eight <laughs> of the dark matter being this stuff. So it's, um, it, it's, it varies depending on the mass. There was a question over here, I think. Okay, great. Okay, so this sort of set, so this sort of sets out, this is the really, really heavy scenario. But that's all I'm gonna say about that scenario for the moment. So let's imagine that we have particle dm, in which case, 
Now, upper limit is probably going to be somewhere around the Planck mass unless it's some heavy composite state, in which case it will be somewhat heavier. So this is a pretty enormous possible mass range. So what can we say to try to... Um, what can we say to try to narrow it down? In, in principle, dark matter could lie anywhere on this range, but in particular regions of this range will have particular properties, and in particular, the way in which the dark matter is produced in the early universe is going to be different. So, let's suppose we start at the very low mass end of this range. Well, from the arguments that we just gave, from the arguments that we just gave related to th this basis here, we know that, let's say this is a KV, we know that if the dark matter is thermal, it has to be above this range. So thermal dark matter begins around the KV scale, dark matter that was in thermal contact for a significant chunk of the early universe. Now, um, we're going to talk about a specific scenario for how dark matter could get its observed abundance if it was in thermal contact. We're going to see that if you take that scenario, then there's another bound. This is not to scale, <laughs> either way. There's another bound at about 100 TeV called the unitarity limit. And so this defines a window between about a KV and 100 TeV masses where the dark matter could have been in thermal contact in the early universe. This is, um, so this is one region that's gotten a lot of interest because if this was true, if the dark matter was in thermal contact with the standard model in the early universe, it means there have to be non-gravitational non interactions between the dark matter and the visible particles. And we can search for those. Uh, I, I will... That will become evident later this lecture. I'm just putting it on here because it's it's going to be a limit. But um, basically, in the thermal in the thermal relic picture that I'm going to go to into in more depth in a moment, um, we'll find that it's the annihilation rate of dark matter to standard model particles that says there are dark matter relic abundance, and there's an upper limit on how fast dark matter can annihilate, which is basically due to probability conservation, um, and which depends on the mass. And if the dark matter is heavier than about 100 TeV, it just can't annihilate well enough to get the right amount of dark matter today. There'd be too much dark matter left over. Yep. Yeah. It's more like, say again, like, I just didn't hear what you said. It's not like black holes, it's more like... So the problem, I mean, if it's asteroids and planets, I mean, it can't be literally asteroids and planets, right? Because they went around at redshift 1,000. I mean, like, sure, if, you, if all you want to do is rotation curves, you could imagine something like that. But you have to imagine something that has been around since the very early universe. So, I mean, like, one possibility, I mean, sometimes people talk about effectively, like, bound states of a huge number of fundamental dark matter particles, which could have masses of, what, grams or whatever. And, and so then in that case, like you could call that macroscopic dark matter. Like it's not the fundamental particle. So, so yeah, so the black holes, the constraints that I said were present on black holes, at the low mass limit, those constraints are coming from if the black hole is too small, it would have evaporated by the present day. And so that constraint doesn't apply to anything except black holes. But yeah, so, so if you want to talk about like gram or kilo or ton scale dark matter, you're probably not very constrained by these macho searches, but you do have to explain how you got that stuff from the CMB epoch. So, sorry, just... Yeah, but, but how, how did you make them before Ed, but when the universe was less than a couple of hundred thousand years old? Yeah, so I mean, I guess then, then you'd also look at, well, does it interact except gravitationally? Um, if so, then the number density, then you know, have, ca can you set constraints on that? Like, can you get co set constraints from like these things running into planets and heating them up, for example? But so, 
Okay, so this is one set of constraints. If we're below the KeV range, if we're down in this low mass range, then we need the dark matter to be pretty cold. Not, it hasn't been in thermal contact with the standard model for a long time if we're to evade these limits from, um, for, from the Lyman Alpha forest. There's another constraint, there's another thing that we can generally say about, so from this scale down, this is non-thermal. There's another thing that we can say about dark matter in this mass range, and that's that it mostly has to be um, bosonic. It can't be fermionic. The argument for this is called the Tremaine gun bound. Okay. So the Tremaine gun bound says, okay, let's just look at the face. Let's assume we have like largely collisionless dark matter. Well, let, let's just look at, let's not even assume that. Let's just look at the phase space density. So this is roughly just as this is like the number density divided by the volume in momentum space. This is like number of particles per unit volume in physical, in um, position space divided by volume in momentum space. So it's of order number density divided by momentum cubed. So we can write that as the mass density, which is what we actually measure gravitationally for a non-relativistic particle, we can write P as just m chi v. So now we know that for fermions, this number has to be less than two. This is just this is just the this is just the Pauli exclusion principle. You've only got a limited number of states if you're talking about identical fermions. Now, if the dark matter is made from a thousand different non-identical fermion species, this bound isn't going to apply because then you can pack in more. But if you're dealing with just identical fermions, you've got to limit this like this. So that tells you that the mass of the dark matter, if you've got a fermion, if the dark matter is composed of identical fermions, is that this mass has to be greater than the dark matter density divided by its velocity cubed to the fourth power, and we can measure, um, we, we can estimate how fast the dark matter is going in dwarf galaxies. We can estimate the density in dwarf galaxies, again, just by looking at like rotation curves of stars around those galaxies. So if we say the dark matter density, so I mean, not even dwarf galaxies, let's just take the Milky Way. The local dark matter density is measured to be about 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter. So I'll just say one. The local velocity, uh, actually, okay, I, I will I will use the dwarf galaxy. So dwarf galaxy, typical density might be 1 GV per cubic centimeter. Typical velocity might be about 10 to the minus 5 C. Um, if I stick those numbers in, then I get about, then I, then I end up with a number around a few hundred EV, which you can confirm for yourself by putting in C and, um, yeah, so I guess. C is one, so this is just ten to the minus. Uh, so this is just ten to the minus five. So you just need to convert centimeters into GV, and you find that this just Pauli exclusion limit, just based on the observations of how dense the dark matter is in dwarfs and how fast it's going in dwarfs, you can exclude uh, dark matter masses below about a few hundred GV if the dark matter is fermionic, because you simply the Pauli exclusion principle would prevent you from packing these dark matter particles as tightly into dwarf galaxies as they're observed to be packed. So down in this range, it's non-thermal, and also it's bosonic. So there are these two broad classes of dark matter models that people, that guides a lot of model building in the field. These are not exclusive classes, but they, they drive a lot of the ideas. One possibility, they also drive the ideas because they're a nice, clean examples of both that connect to other possible problems in the standard model. So there's, so there's, so light, bosonic, old, DM, this can be, I mean, th this, so cold, by this I mean it's been thermally isolated from the standard model for, for, quite, for quite a long time. So this can have masses as light t 
to 10 to the minus 21 eV. It's often helpful to think of this not as individual particles, but as some coherent scalar, but as some coherent um, field. So below about below masses of about a milli eV, the wavelength of these particles is larger than the um, size of a lab on Earth, or milli or micro eV. So wavelength large compared to experiments. Consider as as a field or a wave rather than a particle. So that's sort of one picture. And the classic example of this kind of scenario is the QCD axion. The other regime that guides a lot of thinking, so if you're going this light, you have to be thermally isolated from the standard model, you have to be bosonic, and you can go down to extremely tiny masses. The other region is the thermal region. Here, your dark matter can be either fermionic or bosonic. You're talking masses above about the KeV scale so that you don't run into these warm dark matter bounds. And the classic can be a fermion or boson. In the classic scenario, it's the interactions with the standard model that set the dark matter abundance. And the classic example is the WIMP. Okay. Now, in this thermal region, there's another constraint that's worth mentioning, which is that above the, ab ab which is that um, if the dark matter is sufficiently light, then it can act like, uh, then it will act like a radiation species rather than a matter species in the early universe. This means that during the CMB epoch and during Big Bang nucleosynthesis, which happens earlier when the temperature of the universe is about 1 MeV. So for MKI less than about 1 MeV, it can act as radiation during the nucleosynthesis epoch. And that can, um, that can, have, that can be observationally constrained. So um, this warm dark matter limit is, uh, is a reasonably hard limit. And then it's easier. You are less constrained if the mass is greater than about 1 MeV. If you're in the KeV to MeV region, you just have to be a bit careful that the dark matter is not behaving too much like radiation or um, producing too much effective radiation in the early universe. OK. so. That's my general picture of what mass scales should we be thinking about, what sort of regions um, guide a lot of theoretical work in the field. So what I want to do next is go on and talk about, first about this scenario and how you get the right dark matter relic abundance in this scenario and what that tells you about what you should search for if you're in this scenario. And then um, later I will talk about the cosmology of this. And then in the next lecture, as well as doing that, I'm going to talk about how you search for dark matter in both of these general scenarios. Again, this is not exclusive. You can have other possibility, you know, you can have other possibilities as well. Like dark matter up here does not have to be in thermal contact with the standard model. That's a possibility too. But um, I find this to be helpful as general ways to think about what kinds of searches you can do. Are there any questions about this? Yeah? Uh, yeah, so good, good. So the nucleosynthesis constraint and the CMB constraint, what it's measuring is the 
number of effective radiation degrees of freedom in the universe. So it's, it's like a contribution to G star. <laughs> Um, because that, uh, yeah. so, so, so what it, so it scales the contribution to the number of effective radiation degrees of freedom. It's a measure of how much energy density there is in this. So that means that for radiation, energy density scales like temperature to the fourth power. So, um, yes, it applies to non thermal dark matter as well, but the contribution scales like T to the fourth. So if your temperature is substantially lower than the CMB temperature, you end up not being very constrained. So, like, it applies to non-thermal, but it's typically only really a problem for thermal dark matter. If you're cold, and if you haven't been in thermal contact with the standard model for a long time, and you're much, much, much colder than the standard model, then you don't need to worry about ineffective. That's how these, yeah, that's how these light models evade this bound. Great question. Okay. So let us then move from the general to the specific, and in our last half hour, talk about this thermal scenario. Okay. All right. Okay. So, talk about thermal freeze out. All right. So, I want to consider how the number density of dark matter evolves in the early universe. So, if I've got no, so let's assume first that the dark matter has no interactions that can change its number density. Okay? So, in that case, it's matter. It's just evolving, its abundance is just evolving with the expansion of the universe. So, so with no interactions, that means that its number density is just going to scale like 1 over a cubed, okay? 1 over the scale factor cubed. So, this is not, so this is non, so I'm going to assume, uh, well, I don't even need to assume non relativistic DM evolution for the moment. So, DM evolution, so no number changing. interactions, I'm just going to have the number density of dm times the scale factor cubed doesn't change over time, because this is just counting the total number of dark matter particles in a, in a co-moving volume. So if I have no way to change number density, this is going to be true. So I can expand this out. I can just you know, do, do this by the product rule. And do something like this. I can divide both sides by one over a cubed. Okay, and so then now I know I can write this one over a times dA by dt as just the Hubble constant. So then I get an evolution equation. zero. Okay? So that's in the absence of any number changing interactions. This is a more complicated way of saying the dark matter number density doesn't change as um, the, the dark matter number density just changes with the expansion of the universe. The total number of dark matter particles in a co-moving volume doesn't change. Okay. Now let's suppose that I have some process which changes the dark matter number density. So, I mean, what, so what, what could these processes be? Well, my dark matter could decay away into standard, into other particles. That's one possibility. However, um, I want the dark matter number density to be set really, er to be set quite early in the universe's history, right? Like before the CMB. So if I'm going to have an order one fraction of the dark matter decay away at that time, there's not going to be a whole lot of dark matter left today. <laughs> so, so let's, uh, so let's exclude decay 
from our pot, from our options for, for the moment. Decay, decaying dark matter or decaying other species can be important in this process. Usually, like if you've got another species that decays rapidly that is coupled to the dark matter, then um, the equations that I'm about to show you will get more complicated. But let's just ignore that for the moment. Let's just consider the dark matter. So let's consider the next sort of simplest number changing process, which is something like two dark matter particles come in, and then a miracle occurs. We don't know what happens, but standard model stuff comes out. So now we're positing a non-gravitational interaction between the dark matter and the visible matter that keeps the dark matter in thermal equilibrium with the visible matter, okay? Which allows the dark matter to convert into standard model particles, and the reverse process will allow standard model particles to collide and make dark matter particles, okay? So this is not guaranteed in all dark matter models. This is a hypothesis. This is saying if we have an interaction like this, we'll see that this allows us to explain the present day dark matter density if it has a particular strength. So posit an annihilation process. So 2dm particles goes to some collection of standard model particles. Okay. Okay. So let's just so qualitatively, what's going to happen here? Let's just think about the qualitative picture before we do the quant before we do the quantitative picture. So this pro so early in the universe, when the temperature of the universe is much hotter than the dark matter, then both of then this process, dm, both directions of this process are going to, if the, if the rate is large enough, if the couplings in this diagram are large enough, both of these directions are going to be pretty fast. There's no kinematic barrier. There's plenty of energy for dark matter particles to make standard model particles. There's plenty of energy for standard model particles to make dark matter particles. If, assuming that this is, you know, it's greater, well, there are massless particles in the standard model. So, yeah. Okay, so both directions Okay. Now, when the temperature of the dark matter drops below, so when the temperature of the universe drops below the mass of the dark matter, then, then lighter standard model particles colliding will just not be kinematically allowed uh, you know, th this to make dark matter. So we'll have a situation here where this process is fine, but the reverse process is kinematically forbidden unless the standard model particles together, colliding together are heavier than the dark matter. But if that's true, then you know they'll already be non-relativistic and their abundance will be Boltzmann suppressed as well. So, so once this happens, the dark matter particles can annihilate away, but there's no reverse process. So then this will start to deplete the dark matter abundance. And that depletion will continue until this process becomes inefficient. So that's qualitatively what's going to happen. Let's write down the equations for it. So once we add a process like this, then we're going to have some extra terms on the right-hand side of this equation. So in particular, Let's assume for the moment that the dark matter is made of identical particles. You could make this like chi and chi bar if dark matter had an antiparticle as well, and the calculation would be almost completely identical. Is there a question? Well, if it's lighter than some things in the standard model, then you say, okay, those particular things in the standard model could collide together and make dark matter, and that wouldn't be kinematically forbidden. But if those particular things in the standard model are still in thermal equilibrium with the rest of the standard model bath, then their abundance will be depleted as well. All right, so I, I mean, I'm about to write down the Boltzmann equation, but um, the Boltzmann distribution has an exponential term in it, which is like e to the minus m chi over t. <laughs> so I mean, once the universe is, once, for example, um, you get to the point where protons and antiprotons can annihilate into photons, but the photons don't have enough energy to go the other way, then your proton and antiproton abundance is going to do a nosedive. So anything that's heavier than the dark matter will not be very abundant. Yeah? They could. 
Yes, excellent. So right, so you can have this whole, so, so you sort of have, so you can do the calculation that I'm going to show you, it would also work perfectly fine if it was like annihilating into dark radiation or something on this side, so the annihilation was happening into lighter dark matter particles. Um, so that's called, that's sometimes called a secluded dark sector. In that case, um, so there are sort of two cases here. There's the case where what the dark matter is annihilating into is itself in thermal equilibrium with the standard model. In that case, it's basically got just like going directly to the standard model for the purposes of this calculation. If it's not in thermal equilibrium with the standard model, then what this does is it will heat up the dark sector relative to the standard model. Like, I mean, you're dumping a lot of highly energetic annihilation products into the, into the dark sector and not into the standard model. So that can be a really interesting cosmological scenario. It's sometimes um, constrained by those bounds that I mentioned on light relativistic degrees of freedom. Like if you have dark radiation that is much hotter than the standard model, then um, that, can, that, that can affect Big Bang nucleosynthesis and the CMB. But yeah, I mean, in principle, that can absolutely happen and people have worked out models like that. But I'm going to show you the simple version first, and then we can talk about variations on it. OK, so we're going to have a dark matter depletion term, which goes like the dark matter density. So this is an annihilation process, two-body process. So it goes like the dark matter number density squared. Um, we have a factor of two, which is just a combinatoric factor for two identical particles in the initial state. And we've got an annihilation cross-section. Now we need another term that will take into account the reverse process of standard model particles colliding and making dark matter. So the easiest way to do this is just to say, well, we know there's another contribution that doesn't depend on the amount of dark matter particles that's already around. So it's uh, from the standard model making DM particles. But we know that if you're in... Um, that, that if that if we're in if that that um if we're in equilibrium, these two processes are going to cancel each other out. So we can just write this term as the equilibrium density of dark matter squared divided by two times sigma v. Because like we, we know that it doesn't actually depend it has no n chi dependence, which is what we care about for this problem, and we know that it has to cancel this term when they're in equilibrium. Okay, so this is, our, this is our basic equation. So now we can see the behavior that we talked about qualitative, well, we can start to see the behavior that we talked about qualitatively earlier. So if, okay, so here's our equation. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stop writing the chi superscripts and just this chi subscripts and just write in because there's only one number density that we're interested this problem. Okay, so what's this equilibrium density of dark matter? If dark matter is in complete thermal equilibrium with the standard model, how does number density behave? Well, for non-relativistic particles, this is approximately just the Boltzmann distribution. Well, so we have, so for the non-relativistic case, where T is much less than M chi, there are some prefactors, but I don't care about that for these purposes. I only care about the dimensional factors. We have this result, and for relativistic particles, I, I, there's a prefactor here that depends on you whether it's a fermion or a boson, but I don't care for these purposes. In the ultra-relativistic limit, the dark matter just behaves like a radiation field and its number density goes like temperature cubed. So, so how does this equation work? So when sigma v is really large, then, okay. so let's consider a couple of limits. First limit is the easy one, the one we already did. When this annihilation cross-section goes to zero, then it, we just recover the previous equation. And just evolves with the expansion of the universe. When sigma v is really large, if we take sigma v arbitrarily large, then this the thing that multiplies sigma v is going to be forced small in order to preserve this equation. So, okay, so that's when the cross section is really, really large, when the cross section of these number changing processes is really large, it keeps the dark matter in equilibrium. 
So there's a um, so there's a crossover point here that goes between this expansion term being the most important and the scattering term being the most important. That happens roughly when this term is the same order as these terms. So there's a crossover in behavior. So when the n squared sigma v term is parametrically of the same order as the term that corresponds to the Hubble expansion. I'm dropping factors of three. I don't care about factors of three for these purposes. So this happens when h is approximately equal to n sigma v. So we call this freeze out. So basically the picture here is that if the equilibrium co-moving number density of dark matter is going, so I'm going to look at like the density times t to the minus 3 here. So it's going to be a flat line, and then it's going to start to fall exponentially. Then um, th what this equation will do is it will force me to follow this equilibrium line until this criterion is satisfied, and then m will just start scaling like 1 over a cubed. So at some point, eventually, this n line is going to diverge from this end line is going to diverge from the equilibrium value. So as an approximation, so to do this problem correctly, what you do is you just plug this Boltzmann equation into a computer, you put in this n equilibrium condition, you put in your value for sigma v, and you just solve the differential equation. Um, but, but we can do it approximately analytically by just saying, all right, Let's guess that this final density, this plateau, is just going to be set by the equilibrium density, um, well, this n over t cubed at least, is going to be set by the equilibrium density at this freeze-out point. So we call this, um, so, you know, so, so we refer to this point as freeze-out. We can approximate. And f is approximately being equal to the equilibrium density at freeze out. Okay. Okay. So now the case that I've drawn here kind of implicitly assumes that the dark matter becomes non-relativistic before it freezes out, that I'm on this exponentially falling part of the curve at the time I freeze out. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be true. I could freeze out while I'm still relativistic. Uh, in that case, the calculation is really, really simple. <laughs> the, the asymptotic density just looks like this. Was there a question at the back? Yeah. Um, so this is n equilibrium divide. Yeah, did I do this? Uh, whoops, sorry. You are compl uh, wait. Okay, so what I wanted was like n times a cubed, a scales like one over t. So yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to do is um, is is factor out this. Uh, it, so I can write the diff. I'll, I'll just write it as n times a cubed. What I'm looking at is um, number density co-moving per co-moving volume, which is approximately um, you know, a, a as f if you don't have significant changes in the number of degrees of freedom, then a and t just trace each other, and you can use either as a measure. Oh, on the x, sure, good, good. Sorry, uh, on the on the x-axis. Yeah. So this is um, well, this is increasing time or decreasing temperature, or, yeah, yeah, good, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so the two, so the two cases are freeze out while relativistic, that happens before you're on this exponentially falling curve, so this just says that n equilibrium at freeze out, so by FO I'm going to mean freeze out here, this is approximately just equal to um, this is approximately just equal to t at freeze out cubed. So if I want to look at what is the so if this then just 
dilutes to the present day. Let's ignore changes in the number of degrees of freedom for the moment and just assume that T scales like 1 over A, then N at some late time is just going to be approximately equal to N at freeze out times the ratio of temperatures or the ratio of scale factors which is, so this is So pretty much independent of when you freeze out, the number density at late time is just going to be the number density associated with the relativistic degree of freedom. So this tells you in this case, if you've got freeze out well relativistic, the number density of the dark matter is going to be comparable to the number density of photons. Okay? So if this is to, so this is a hot dark matter scenario, the dark matter has to be extremely light. Uh, you know, it has to be like down around the EV scale because um, we know that the photon to baryon mass ratio is about 10 to the 10 photons for every one proton and the mass density of dark matter has to be comparable to the mass density of baryons. So this points to very light, hot dark matter. So the more interesting case is when the freeze out happens while non-relativistic. So in that case, So, so a cold relic where you have freeze out while well, non-relativistic. Then we have that H should be close to N times equilibrium times sigma V. So, um, So this is the equilibrium density of dark matter, so that we need this to be approximately true in the radiation-dominated epoch. If this happens during radiation domination, which is the case for almost all dark matter models, because matter domination doesn't happen until the temperature of the universe is down around 1 eV. So this happens in radiation domination, then H squared we know is proportional to rho, which is proportional to T to the fourth. So we can write H scales like T squared, the only other scale in the problem is G, which is set by M Planck. So we have an estimate for H, which is like T squared over M Planck. So, um, do I want to do this the hard way or the easy way? Okay, so let's, so let's ask, okay, let's try and decide the best way to do this. Is it okay if I take another five, five to ten minutes? People can survive without coffee for that long? Okay, take that as a yes. Okay, I apologize for keeping you from your coffee, but this is, but, um, it's good to get to the end of this estimate. Okay, so let's write, so we can write H equals T squared over M Planck. Let's, um, let's just, just knowing that it's proportional to T squared, another thing that we can do is like normalize this to the H when the temperature is equal to the dark matter mass times, I'm going to define a new parameter that I call X. I'm going to define X to be M chi over T. So then that tells me that H is just, so H at freeze out is just H of M times X evaluated at freeze out to the minus two. 
and this is, and then I can write this side of the equation in terms of x as well. This is going to give me okay. So this is an so I can rewrite this as. Now, the important thing to know here is to notice here is that this side of the equation has an exponential dependence on x at freeze out, and this side only has a power law dependence on x at freeze out. As a consequence, while this is a transcendental equation, the first order approximate solution is that xf just has a log dependence on these parameters on the right hand side. Like the zeroth order thing you can do is say, okay, the variation with xf on this side is small. If you ignore it, then xf. just looks like this. So the thing I want you to understand here is, is that this ratio between, so xf is the ratio between the mass of the dark matter and the temperature at freeze out, only has a log dependence on the other parameters of the problem. And it turns out that for a pretty wide range of masses that we're interested in, xf ends up being about um, a factor of 20 or so, if you want to get the right relic density. Okay, so the number density of dark matter at freeze out, which is what we want to work out for our fine, which is what we want to work out for our final relic density, goes like but we know we know from this criterion that we could so this exponential is the dangerous thing because this exponential is you know exponentially sensitive to what xf is at freeze out and we don't know this well enough that you know that there are errors on this which will get big when exponentiated but we know that we can set e to the minus xf equal to h divided by sigma v times m chi t to the three halves so we can rewrite this as um okay so we can rewrite this as just h of m chi xf to the minus 2 divided by sigma v. And then after and then after this point, so this is n freeze out as set, after freeze out, out the dm number scale will scale as 1 over a cubed. So a convenient normalization is that after freeze out, the photon number will also scale as 1 over a cubed. So we can look at the ratio of the number of dark matter particles to the number of photons and, believe, and know that that will stay fairly constant. Um, the exception is that if you have something that injects a lot of extra photons, like electrons and positrons annihilating, that will change this ratio slightly. But for an order of magnitude estimate, we can just assume that it stays the same. So at freeze out and gamma is going to be approximately t at freeze out cubed. So this is m chi cubed over xf cubed. So then this ratio and chi over n gamma it's going to behave like this now and furthermore note we said that h of m chi we said that h was proportional to t squared h of m chi is proportional to 1 over m chi squared so this is approximately independent of m chi. We could choose any value. I mean, another way to say it is this is m chi squared over m Planck. So this is approximately just equal to 1 over m Planck. Now, OK, so we've got this mass dependence over here. But it follows, recall that what we can actually measure today is not the number density of dark matter 
it's the, um, it's the mass density of dark matter. So if we look at the mass density of dark matter divided by the photon number, and we expect this to be similar today and after freeze out, then this is just going to be, going to cancel this here, and it's going to be just xf over sigma v. So this freeze out mechanism gives us a very simple uh, expression for what the dark matter mass density should be. We know the number density of photons today. Uh, we know that xf is only log dependent on the mass. So to a first approximation, this tells us that the observed abundance of dark matter today is just completely set by one over sigma v, by the annihilation cross section. So the nice thing about this thermal freeze out scenario is that in a pretty mass dependent way, once you've measured the mass density of dark matter today, you have a prediction for this annihilation rate to the standard model particles. And if we were to just, um, if we were to just put in some numbers, DM mass density, we know the DM mass density is about five times the baryon mass density. So, and a baryon weighs about a GeV, so that's about five GeV times the baryon number density. We also know that the baryon number density is about 10 to the, is about 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the photon number density. So this gives us some, um, yeah, so this gives us something like, it's actually about five times 10 to the minus 10 times and gamma times 5 GV. Okay, so then, so this gives us, and we know that M Planck is about 10 to the 19 GV. So rho chi over N gamma is, should be approximately, uh, you know, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 9 GV. We want this to be equal to. 1 over M Planck, XF over sigma V. If we just guess that XF is going to be roughly an order one number because it's a log quantity, after all, then this gives us, so first guess, let's guess that XF is approximately equal to one, then that gives us that um, sigma v uh, that should be, so 1 over sigma v should be approximately 10 to the 19 gv times 2.5 times 10 to the mine gv. So that's uh, 10 to the 10 gv, uh, gv squared, if I have it right. So sigma v in this case corresponds to 1 over 10 to the 5 gv squared. I did this right. So this is about 1 over 100 TV squared. So if you were saying, okay, I want to express this in terms of such, so you might guess that if this was some particle physics cross section, like some 2 to 2 cross section like this, this is going to be some coupling scale divided by some mass scale. So this tells you that if you want a perturbative coupling, order 1 or less, this suggests that M chi should be less than about 100 TV for alpha, less than one. And you can do this more carefully. There's a strict upper bound for, um, there's a strict upper bound on the annihilation cross section from the unitarity bound. And you find that through this argument to get the right relic density to explain the dark matter density today, you need the dark matter to be lighter than a couple of hundred TV at the heaviest. So that was a lot of algebra. Key points to take away from this. Once we know the dark matter density, we can predict sigma v. The relevant mass scale for sigma v is um, it's about 1 over 100 TeV squared. If you say that that corresponds to a coupling squared divided by a mass scale squared, then 
the mass scale is going to be less than about 100 TeV. If you put in alpha to equals 10 to the minus 2, like an electroweak alpha, then you're going to get about a 1 TeV mass scale here. This is what's called the Wimp miracle, that sort of range of 100 GeV to 1 TeV is a mass range that we might find interesting for other reasons. It's around the electroweak scale. And that electroweak scale couplings and electroweak scale masses get you close to the right annihilation cross-section to naturally explain why there's the observed amount of dark matter today if, you, um, if it was in thermal contact with the standard model in the early universe. Okay. Thank you for waiting. Uh, I will let people go get coffee now. <laughs>